After celebrating his 70th birthday, Mr. Sebastian found himself pondering the end of his life once again. Well, what can you do? It seems like it's time. Although one should have prepared for this all their life. But what's the point now? Think or don't think, nothing will change anymore. It's just that it's upsetting. He lived his life, not a wasted one, a good life, and achieved a lot. And even more than he dreamt of. But the main thing is missing. Because it turns out the main thing isn't money, factories, newspapers, steamships, of which he figuratively speaking is the owner. It's something else entirely. Family, children, heirs. Whether you want it or not, you recall words from some kind of religious book, what's the use if you conquer the whole world but have no love? You're not a human then, just a clanging symbol. Or something like that. Mr. Sebastian was never religious, never read any such books, and didn't even know what a symbol was. He just heard that expression somewhere and remembered it from time to time, because he remained alone. And it's not that there's no one to talk to or no glass of water to offer. That's all taken care of. People will talk and offer. There's no doubt about that. Strangers always oblige. For money, that is. Just lure them in, then you can't shake them off. But he doesn't have his own family. Those whom you can love, and who will love you not for your money and status, but simply because your family, a father, a grandfather. But there are none like that, and you can't buy them with any amount of money. So he spends his life clanging an old and unwanted symbol. Because Mr. Sebastian doesn't have a family, and never really did. Well, there was in his childhood, when his parents were alive. Who knows, if they hadn't died, hadn't left eight-year-old Sebastian an orphan, everything in his life might have turned out differently. They would have taught him something, his mom and dad, about how to live as a family, how to love, how to respect relatives. But what can you do? The truck driver who drunkenly got behind the wheel and smashed into the Zaporozets, in which Sebastian's parents were returning from their country house, Leaving their son to spend the summer holidays with his elderly grandmother didn't know anything about this. His parents died, and upon hearing the news, the grandmother also died of a heart attack. And Sebastian started third grade as an orphan. He didn't have any other relatives. Those who would agree to take in the orphan. He himself barely remembered if there were any relatives. Seems like there were some sort of aunt on his mother's side and also on his father's side they gathered at the grave sometimes wiped away tears but they didn't show the slightest interest in the orphan child what's there to remember about them but sebastian remembered his parents perfectly they were good people they truly loved each other and their only son maybe they were the only ones who loved Maybe it was for them that he tried to become someone. Studied better than anyone, read books, behave decently. After all, what a bringing in an orphanage, what kind of kids? All sorts, to say the least. They smoked from the age of ten, skipped classes, misbehaved, didn't really study. Because, what's the point? And indeed, what's the point? if after graduation you'll just end up in some vocational school anyway. Then you'll get some kind of profession, and then just live your life, make ends meet. The main thing is to get married or get married, start adult life. And they did. Half of the girls were already pregnant by graduation. True, sometimes their kids added to the population of orphanages. But not all. Most just lived like that, without waiting for adulthood, they started this so-called adult life. They got a vocational education, struggled however they could. Sebastian wasn't like that. He aspired to education, to obtaining a prestigious profession. That's what his parents wanted. And even though they died, 
their son couldn't betray their hopes. And who won in the end? No, he didn't maintain any contact with his classmates from the orphanage. There was no point to it. And many of them are no longer alive. But those who are, at 20 years old, becoming parents, have long since seen not only grandchildren, but great-grandchildren. Yes, they've been through a lot. But what of it? Now at least they're not lacking love. And Sebastian, yes, he achieved a lot, but he's alone, without family and loved ones. But it could have been completely different. He also had his first love, still in the orphanage, Agatha. She was also an excellent student, smart, very proper girl, and beautiful. Who else to fall in love with? The other orphans didn't really like them, considering them prudes, nerds, and show-offs who thought too highly of themselves. And they did indeed understand that they could achieve more than vocational school and working in a factory, and they aimed for that. But they fell in love along the way, walked hand in hand, sneaked away after classes to stroll down the street like everyone else. Among the passers-by, no one knew they were orphans. Just an ordinary boy and girl, 10th graders, in their school uniforms. They purposely wore them. By their uniforms, you couldn't tell that they were from an orphanage. Not very well, to be honest. They walked, even kissed. But they didn't get to anything serious. Although there was talk that after coming of age, they would marry. But Nina didn't agree to close relations. And where would they establish them if, like others, they were in sheds, or even during the day, in an empty bedroom, leaving someone on watch? Yuck! Not for them, the excellent students and examples for everyone. If they did that, they would lower themselves. So nothing happened. And by the time they came of age, they were already studying at different universities, living in different dorms. So everything was put on hold. But maybe they should have gotten married. Perhaps everything would be different now. No, Mr. Sebastian was indeed married, not just once, but three times. But it all turned out somehow, not to his liking, you know? Well, the first time is somewhat forgivable. Twenty years old, hormones, it's time, and he wanted his own, real family. He and Ariana, his first wife, were studying together on their third year. Sebastian, of course, was handsome and interesting not only in terms of appearance. He was smart, athletic, and even learned to play the guitar. And Ariana was just okay-looking, from the breed of gray mice. She fell head over heels for Sebastian, of course, but he, he was more in love with her family. Yes, she was a homebody, from a good, full family. And Ariana was smart. She understood that her looks alone wouldn't win over the first guy in the class. So she started to act differently. She casually invited him over to her place. And he ended up at a family dinner. Just an ordinary, perfect dinner. Cabbage soup, fried potatoes with cutlets. Nothing special. No one was expecting him. But it all felt so homey. In the large kitchen, around the round table. Tablecloth, spoons, forks, bread basket. Everything was different from the orphanage or the student cafeteria. Mom bustling around, adding more food, fussing. Oh, Ariana, why didn't you warn us about the guest? I would have baked an apple pie. Eat. Sebastian, eat. Take some sour cream, a piece of bread. Want another cutlet? Take it, take it. You're a young man, you need to eat more. And Dad, a chief engineer at some factory. A solid guy, serious, but friendly. Enjoyed a good joke, but also liked to have serious conversations. Remember, Sebastian, in our line of work, Education never ends. Progress never stands still, and we always need to keep up. 
Their apartment wasn't big, just a two-room one, but it was separate. A rarity for those times. Ariana had her own room. Small, cozy, almost like a child's. A narrow couch, doll sitting on the secretary desk, a hamster rustling in its cage. Seeing off the guest, Ariana's mom would invite him to come over more often. In a simple way. Her dad would shake his hand, look serious and significant. And how could Sebastian, an orphan, not fall in love? And Ariana too, not exactly a beauty queen, but not at all unattractive either. A sweet, cozy girl. He started visiting this lovely apartment often, even when Ariana's parents were at work. And what else could they do after that? Only get married. And they did. There was a wedding. Also nice, respectable, and with a royal gift from the parents. And here you go, young ones, something you probably couldn't even dream of. The keys to your own apartment. Start your independent life, the bride's father announced to the applause of the guests. Turns out, Ariana also had a grandmother who had recently received a one-bedroom apartment. Now the old lady would happily move in with her daughter and son-in-law. It was an old, familiar, beloved neighborhood. And the young couple could move to the outskirts, to the impassable mud, with uncollected construction waste sticking out. Where it was no easier to get to the Institute than to Mars, because even if you wait for the bus, you won't be able to get on. Sebastian didn't dream of anything like that. Not at all. Instead of a family home, motherly care, and fatherly lessons, he got instability, constant inconvenience, and on top of that, Ariana, whom he didn't love at all unlike her mom, dad, lunches, and dinners. But what could he do? She was his wife, and he was her husband. He's studying on the fourth year, getting a higher scholarship. Just live and be happy. Couldn't you eat at the cafeteria? I don't have time to cook, and besides, there's nothing to cook with. You can't buy anything here. And I'm not going to lug potatoes from the city. If you want, cook pasta yourself. I'm also studying, in case you've forgotten, this young wife reproached him every day. Her father-in-law and mother-in-law, when they occasionally visited, also made faces and comments. Why haven't you arranged anything yet? You've been living here for almost a year and haven't settled in. Look at the neighbors, they're unloading furniture again. People buy stuff. At least put your names down for a wall unit, submit an application for a carpet. We'll help with the money, of course, they would say. These were the kinds of conversations they had. And this was only in the first year. As if the parents didn't know they were giving away their treasure to a poor student without family or kin. Later, more unpleasant statements were made, sometimes by the father-in-law, sometimes by the mother-in-law. Oh, Ariana, you fell for his cherubic face. What does he need? He can easily finish college. No need to wander around dorms, live in your own apartment. And a young woman, beautiful, always by his side. She'll take care of him, comfort him, they would say. They were smart too. If only they knew how Sebastian longed for the dormitory. How tired he was of this young, beautiful woman whose character turned out to be not at all sweet after a year. However, he carried this burden for four years. He and Ariana often talked about divorce. They would argue and then immediately say, let's get divorced. Then she would cry. So pitifully, so helplessly that. Well, they would make up. And Sebastian never really thought he would get divorced. He thought it was for life. For better or for worse, but forever. Maybe eventually it would get better. They would grow to love each other. They finished college, started working. But things didn't get any better. They both grew up. 
but the relationship should have changed too, no longer like students. But everything between them remained the same. Nowhere, that is. The mother-in-law started singing a different tune. Divorce, Ariana, while you're still young. It's a good thing you didn't have kids. So you should hurry up, girl, hurry up, she would say. Ariana started to think. She no longer cried after fights, no longer sought reconciliation. And one day she said herself, enough, Sebastian. I feel like we're just wasting time. There's a good man courting me, older than me, well-established. Maybe she thought her husband would get angry, would try to persuade her or promise her the world. But if poor Ariana knew how joyfully Sebastian's heart leapt, then she wouldn't have to endure her tears, reproaches, and everything else. Oh, what relief, what a deep bow to this good man. Well, they got divorced, quietly and peacefully. Sebastian handed Ariana over to good hands. He moved into a rented room with a clear conscience. For a while, he enjoyed his bachelor freedom so much that he didn't think about marriage at all. For some time, he even considered staying a bachelor forever. There were girls, of course. How could there not be? He was young, handsome, educated. But it was all just passing, because Sebastian put all his efforts into work and study. He enrolled in graduate school, started thinking about his dissertation. So he didn't have time for girls. Even relationships that started with a young nurse from the clinic didn't last. She used to come to the landlady to give injections. That's how they met. But this girl was married, so she didn't have any special interest in Sebastian, which suited him just fine. Study, work, defend his dissertation, meetings with the nurse. That's how time passed. It became more and more interesting, more promising. He was already over 30 when Vanessa came into his life. Well, yeah, he fell for her looks. She was amazing, with a movie star figure, a porcelain face, big green eyes, a bunch of blonde hair. Twenty years old, free, but already knowing her worth and not wanting to sell herself cheaply. As Sebastian suspected even before the wedding, with a slight degree of mental retardation. But with pretensions. What attracted her? Well, that's quite clear. An adult man, a candidate of technical sciences. Vanessa probably didn't understand what that meant, but it flattered her. He had already bought a car. A lot of, of course. But even that was impressive back then. He also had his own apartment. And prospects. Falling for this beauty, he spread his feathers before her, trying to hint at the prospects that awaited them very soon. However, they were indeed there. And Vanessa, besides that, apparently truly fell in love. To be honest, it was difficult to understand her feelings. Besides, she turned out to be unusually hysterical, demanding, deceitful, and, strangely enough, completely frigid. All of this made their life together unbearable. Although sometimes there were enlightenments. Sometimes the nasty sides of her character seemed to take a vacation, and Vanessa would become sweet, quiet, and touching. It was for these rare moments that he had to endure her but also out of pity. After all, she was almost 15 years younger than Sebastian. He felt responsible for this woman. If he divorced her, where would she go? It was only after several years of marriage that he learned the truth about her parents. They were alive but drank excessively. She had received some secondary education but had never worked a day in her life and she had no skills whatsoever. How could he leave her? If only there was a good man for Vanessa. It turned out that she herself was considering it. And besides, she had been cheating on her husband for a long time. And not with just one person. In short, 
This marriage lasted for five years and ended in nothing. Vanessa, having matured and, probably, having gained, if not intelligence, then at least business acumen, eventually found a suitable suitor and left after a series of scandals and hysterics. At 40, Mr. Sebastian, already a well-established man, was once again a bachelor, albeit a quite enviable one. But he wasn't thinking about new marriages. The first two experiences were too bitter. What a mistake it was. First, he married for the sake of a settled life with a gray mouse. He got nothing but domestic unrest, complete lack of peace and comfort. Complaints and nagging. The second time, he was attracted by beauty and got something completely out of this world. Now he didn't even know what to look for and what he might stumble upon with such luck. And the times were troubled, the end of the century, but also promising. Mr. Sebastian started earning money. And soon he realized he caught the wave. It was truly his calling. But only after 40 did he realize that there were no children and they were needed. Both marriages were childless. But this could be considered more of a blessing. With Ariana, they probably didn't have children due to youth and inexperience. Or maybe their bodies weren't ready. Later on, she seemed to have given birth to someone. Whether from a good person or someone else was unknown. Sebastian deliberately didn't inquire. With Vanessa, God saved him. With such a lady, what kind of children? She managed to have quite a bit of fun before marriage. So probably she couldn't have children anymore. But even as a bachelor, he couldn't have children. He even considered adoption. But after consulting with knowledgeable people, he realized that it wasn't that simple. A single man might simply not be allowed to adopt children. And if he succeeded, that was also a lottery. It was unknown what kind of child he would get, whose genes, and how they would manifest themselves. While he was pondering this, he met Laura. Mr. Sebastian didn't immediately understand that something was possible between them. Firstly, he was almost 20 years older. Secondly, she wasn't a simpleton like Ariana or slightly understanding like Vanessa. Laura had recently graduated from college, and she also had a goal in life. She wanted to work and achieve her goals, just as serious as Mr. Sebastian's. He had already achieved a lot, but he had no intention of stopping. And Laura was at the beginning of her journey. Perhaps there was some calculation in her attention to her boss, but not only that. She didn't intend to live off him. She wanted to achieve everything on her own. In short, they got together and got married. His third five-year period of married life began with Laura. He immediately told Laura that he wanted children and wasn't going to delay it. Maybe we shouldn't rush? Right now is the golden time for me in terms of my career, she said. And for me, dear, it's the last chance to have children. You not only need to give birth to a child, but also raise them, give them an education, help them with everything. And if I become a father at over 50, you might end up a young widow with a child in your arms. So let's not delay, and don't worry about your career, we'll manage. After all, we'll find a qualified nanny eventually. They started living together but pregnancy didn't happen. Only on the fifth year of marriage did his wife announce the news. They would soon have a child, but the happiness was short-lived. Oscar, our main condition was your constant readiness to work, and yesterday I couldn't find you again. Sorry, boss, but I drove Miss Laura to the fitness club yesterday. She keeps asking me, and her orders need to be followed. What fitness club? She's supposed to be expecting a child, not hopping around clubs. Well, I don't know, but I take her there every evening, Oscar muttered gloomily. So, I didn't quite understand. Anyway, forget it, it's her business after all. 
This news, along with the tone of the chauffeur, raised doubts. Mr. Sebastian didn't confront his wife, nor did he spy on her. He went to the medical center himself and underwent the necessary tests, confirming what he had long suspected. He was infertile. That evening, he laid out the certificate in front of Laura and asked directly whose child they were really expecting. Strangely enough, Laura didn't even falter, didn't play the offended innocent, cry, or try to justify herself. Sorry, Sebastian, but I suspected this for a long time, she tapped her finger on the medical report. We've been together for five years. I've seen all the gynecologists. I don't have any problems, but pregnancy isn't happening. You've never had children. So, I had enough sense to put two and two together and understand what that means. I'm turning 30 soon. You said we shouldn't delay. Well, I hooked up with my fitness trainer, a young, handsome, and healthy guy. I got pregnant by him. I thought you wouldn't find out. We'll raise our child together. It didn't work out. Forgive me. Make your decision. I've said everything. This calm, composed speech outraged Mr. Sebastian the most. His wife had decided to betray him and felt not the slightest guilt. She was planning to deceive him for the rest of her life. Yes, most women would say Laura was right. Why should she deprive herself of the opportunity to become a mother? She also wanted to make her infertile husband happy. But if you think about it, was it really just for motherhood? Did she only want a child? Oh no. She wanted a young, healthy stallion. That's what she desired. And she didn't just meet him for the sake of a child, even after getting pregnant. To understand and forgive this would mean becoming a laughingstock for the whole world, an old fool who raises someone else's child and wears horns that his young wife regularly sets. Mr. Sebastian disagreed with this, so the third marriage ended in divorce. As part of the settlement, the wife received a three-bedroom apartment with the condition that she would not bother him anymore. She didn't intend to, anyway. So, at the end of his fifth decade, Mr. Sebastian was left a lonely man. Forever. Now all his strength and time were spent on his business, which had positively affected him. He didn't think about his personal life, being a childless, thrice-divorced man. Sometimes he had one-off, noncommittal dates, but eventually he stopped even those. But when he turned 70, he began to think not about his personal life, but about his death. Yes, no matter how much money he earned, he would still have to die, possibly very soon. And who was he working for then? Well, let's suppose his work was needed by people who didn't even know about Mr. Sebastian himself. But as for what he himself has thanks to his work, there is no one to convey it to. No one will sincerely shed a tear for his lonely life. No one will mention him kindly. Well, on one hand, it's a made-up and even laughable problem. Some guy once said, after we're gone, they might as well have a flood, and they'll declare national mourning and celebrate the anniversary of his death every year. What's the point? That's not what he needs. He needs someone to love him. And it must be sincere, real love. Not for money, but because there was such a person, kind and good. So, at the end of his life, he felt this desire because who else but a 70-year-old man knows that you can't buy love and gratitude. Again, the problem seems insignificant, considering there are so many needy people in the world. Leave everything to some shelter, for old people or orphans. This is an option, of course, but you can't check from the afterlife how it all worked out. And from newspapers and TV shows, he knows that the lion's share will likely go not to the needy, but to those who manage them. There's another option, too. Targeted assistance. Parents write in, saying, my child is sick. 
We need so much for treatment. Well, go ahead and give it. But here's where TV helps, too. You see how it goes. The parents get the money, and then you see. The child was sick before, and they're still sick. But the parents got a new car. Or something else. They won't remember it with gratitude, but with laughter. They believed, fools. They gave money. That's roughly how Mr. Sebastian reasoned about charity. He didn't have any close relatives, and he still doesn't. What can you do? No, he wasn't going to forget those people he liked. But there were so few of them left. Well, from the staff, people. He had a housekeeper, Mrs. Ophelia. A very nice woman. About five years older than him. He used to complain to her. Just when he got divorced from Laura. Then he was left alone. Without a wife and children. And she. Oh, come on, it's one less hassle for you. Compared to those wives, being alone is better. And children too. I gave birth to three. And what's the use? My son is already a stranger. And the daughters just squabble amongst themselves over my pension and salary. Give them an inch, they take a mile. And the grandkids grew up the same way. Mrs. Ophelia died about five years ago. And even before that, she didn't work as Mr. Sebastian apparently supplemented her pension every month. And helped out when needed. She was content and grateful. But he definitely wouldn't help her children and grandchildren. Even though they asked. And with everyone else, it was the same. There were no others, all the others were far away. But leaving everything that was earned to no one in favor of the poor was simply unfair. So Mr. Sebastian decided to take matters into his own hands without asking anyone for help. And he came up with this to dress up as a homeless person and wander around the world, still completely unknown to him, the world of homeless and destitute. He knew that most of these outcasts of society were to blame for their situation. And even if you did everything possible for them, for money, that is, to cure them of their acquired diseases, clothe them, provide shelter, work, and so on, very soon they would return to their former state. There were such examples, alas. But, let's suppose, even if a hundred people are exactly like that, there's a hundred and first who ended up in such a situation through no fault of their own, but through bad luck. Suddenly some person is in trouble, hoping for help. And Sebastian himself. If he didn't have that inner core and good people around him, couldn't he become one of those outcasts? Easily. After all, he was an orphan. If he had fallen in love with the rebel Brittany at the orphanage instead of the honor student Grace, he would have gone downhill with her. But he didn't. And assuming the guise of a homeless old man turned out not to be so simple. Well, he managed to beg his driver for an old, work-worn jacket and a pair of matching pants. But still, it wasn't quite right. He didn't shave for a week, letting his unkempt gray beard grow out. Well, in short, preparing to walk among the common people took almost a whole month. But then he looked at himself in the mirror and didn't recognize himself. Yes, he had transformed into a dirty, unkempt old beggar. In this guise, he left the house. For the first time in many years, without a car, without a driver. He just walked out and started walking, not knowing where yet. Mr. Sebastian lived in a prestigious neighborhood where such individuals didn't stray. So, as he walked down the street, he caught several surprised glances from windows and passing cars. He tried to enter a store where he often went in his former appearance to buy something small, always greeted by friendly looks from the salespeople and security guards. But this time was different. The appearance of a dirty old man didn't make the best impression. 
The pleasant young cashier slipped out from behind the counter and approached, saying, Old man, you better leave. You won't be able to buy anything anyway. But you might mess something up. But I just wanted to buy something to eat, the old man murmured plaintively. What's going on? called the security guard. Help this old man out of here. Take him away from here. I can't even touch him, the girl said. Can I do it? the guard said discontentedly. And, approaching, he began to make uncertain gestures around the homeless man. Out, Grandpa, out. There's nothing here for people like you. I can't even afford bread here sometimes. Go a couple of blocks down the street. There's a place there that's more your speed. Ugh. And you stink. It's cold here to air things out. Without arguing, Mr. Sebastian left the store. So, it turns out that where they once welcomed him with open arms, now they turned him away. And they didn't even recognize him. But he's still the same old man, just in different clothes. Ah, people, the old man thought. Thanks for not beating me up. And not out of great kindness either. They were just afraid to get their hands dirty. He trudged along the cold winter street. It turns out it's uncomfortable here when you can't get into your warm car, can't wrap yourself up tighter in a fur coat or jacket with fur. How do these homeless people live, he thought. Like this, I won't last long. Then he came across a familiar restaurant where Mr. Sebastian was a frequent guest. He was so frozen now that he forgot about his appearance and tried to pull open the heavy door. What's this? The doorman protested. Are you completely out of it, old man? Get out of here before they call the police. Why call the police? I didn't do anything wrong. You'll find out why over there. Go. What's going on, Thomas? The owner, a longtime acquaintance of Mr. Sebastian, approached the door. He smiled at first, but then was horrified at the sight of who was trying to enter his establishment. Get him out of here before anyone notices. Call security. What are you standing there for? After such a beauty, we'll have to close for sanitation. Get out of here. Well, that's it. I definitely won't set foot here again, Mr. Sebastian thought irritably, stepping away from the grand entrance to the restaurant. But where could he go now? Home? But he hadn't finished his business yet. He hadn't even started it. Hey, father, someone called out. He turned around. The young guy in the waiter's uniform came out from the back entrance with a cup of tea and a bun. Here, warm up for now, and come back later in the evening, when it gets dark, something more substantial will be ready. Thanks, son, Mr. Sebastian replied, almost with tears in his eyes, surprised not so much by the boy's gesture as by his own feelings. Today, he had been called both father and grandpa. But for some reason, it was the term father from this boy's mouth that touched him the most. Or perhaps it was his act, giving a cup of hot tea to a frozen man. Are you new in this neighborhood? came a voice from behind. He turned around and saw someone just like himself, a bit younger maybe, looking a bit shabby. Don't worry, they won't bother you here. Come back tonight. This Christian, he's a real gem. Feed so many of our kind. A real good guy. We know when his shift is. We all gather. You should too. There's enough for everyone. And who is this Christian? Why does he help? Mr. Sebastian asked. Who knows, the man shrugged indifferently. Maybe he's kind. Maybe he owes someone something, or maybe he's just a saint. Doesn't matter to us, as long as he provides. Though he doesn't give out alcohol, that's for sure. In the evening, Mr. Sebastian approached the back entrance of the restaurant. 
There were already about five people gathered there, looking homeless. They shuffled around in the cold, talking amongst themselves, waiting, presumably for the appearance of the waiter. Soon he emerged with neat packages of food. He greeted everyone warmly, distributing the food. After receiving his delicious-smelling packet, Mr. Sebastian thanked him but didn't rush to leave. He waited until the last homeless person received their food, then, left alone with the waiter, asked the question that interested him. Tell me, why do you help us? It's simple. Because I understand people like you. I've been homeless myself. And if it weren't for kind people, I would have perished on the streets. So I guess I'm sort of paying back my debts. Don't come tomorrow. I have the day off. But the day after tomorrow, sure. Where do you live? The old man asked. I live with my wife in a hostel. So I can't offer anyone a place to stay, sorry. I was just asking. Thank you very much. Mr. Sebastian went home, somehow sure that he had found what he was looking for. He had been homeless. A orphan, probably. The guy was about 25 to 30 years old. But he felt different from the others. Not like those in the store or the restaurant. They had decent paychecks. But not one offered a crust of bread to a hungry old man. And he didn't even have to ask. He brought it out and distributed it. And if the owner saw, he could fire him. Meanwhile, Christian, the waiter, was pondering almost the same thing. Ah, uh, they'll fire me, that's for sure. Trying to arrange something with my wards to meet somewhere else isn't the best option either. They'll see it and think I'm stealing something from home. But I'll find another job if they fire me. But what about the hungry people? They'll still come to the same place, waiting. He couldn't think of a way out. The boss had said again recently, How long are you going to keep bringing these leftovers? We have a decent restaurant in a decent neighborhood. And if someone sees who's hanging out in the backyard, but they come late at night, nobody sees. And then they spread out all over the neighborhood. Eating, drinking on the streets, sneaking into the entrances. What do you want for us to be shut down? Everything is fine. They don't spread out or drink anywhere. They're just hungry people. I'm just giving them some food that's not up to our standard. If you're such a good guy, Christian, why don't you open up your own diner for all the hungry riffraff and feed them on your own dime? It's easy to be so kind-hearted. They're hungry, you know. If they hadn't been drinking from an early age, they wouldn't be dying of hunger in their old age. Christian understood that in many ways, the restaurant owner was right, but he couldn't give up on his mission. Yes, he dreamt of helping the homeless because he had been one himself. And he still couldn't boast of having a stable situation. Besides, he simply didn't have the money to organize full-fledged assistance. Someday I'll earn enough and still fulfill my dream, thought the young man, recalling all the hardships of his difficult life. Christian couldn't remember his parents or how he ended up in the orphanage. He was too young to remember anything. After reaching adulthood, like all orphanage alumni, he was given an apartment and some resettlement money. Life was manageable, especially for a serious young man not inclined to various vices. He found a decent job, set up his life, and a whole year passed peacefully and happily. Then suddenly a new joy came. His birth mother found him. Like all orphans, Christian dreamed of having a family. And although he was dissuaded and warned, he took his mother in. This not-so-old woman with traces of a wild life on her face was so happy to have found her dear son. She tearfully told him that she would never have abandoned him. He was taken away from her by deceit. And then her whole life went downhill. Now she had neither a home, nor a job, nor money. 
So wouldn't Christian allow her to live with him? I'll start a new life now. We'll live like normal people, as a family, the mother said. Of course, Christian agreed. But a week later, he bitterly regretted it. At first, his mother decided to properly bid farewell to her old life. He couldn't kick her out and could only watch as his cozy apartment turned into a dirty den. And three months later, there was no more housing. In his absence, his drunken mother caused a fire. The apartment burned down completely. So Christian found himself on the street with nothing but the clothes on his back and no money. Now his life was going downhill. He was soon asked to leave his job. The young man couldn't even afford a bed in a hostel. Soon it became apparent that he was homeless. There was no opportunity to find another job. And Christian thought he would just disappear, having finally hit rock bottom. A friend he grew up with in the orphanage saved him. He allowed Christian to stay in his apartment. Christian cleaned himself up, restored his documents, and found a job. With time, he saved up some money, rented a room in a hostel where he met Maria. They got married, and a son was born. The first thing Christian dreamed of was earning enough money to buy a house or apartment for his family. The second was helping people who found themselves in difficult situations. All this Christian told a decent elderly man he met after another shift at the restaurant during another food distribution for the homeless. It was Mr. Sebastian who decided to talk to the guy without pretending to be homeless anymore. At first, Christian didn't understand why the old man was so interested in him, but something about the old man warmed him up. And do you really think you'll be able to help people someday? Or will you give up on that idea if money suddenly appears? Money doesn't just appear out of nowhere. I'll earn it, save it up. Well, yes, first I'll buy decent housing for my family, and then I'll really start helping. Besides, I'm not the only one like this. There are people who can help and advise. Of course, money is the main thing in this matter. Well, I'll manage. This was not the last conversation Mr. Sebastian had with Christian. He often approached the restaurant, watching as the young man distributed food and became more and more convinced that he had finally found what he had been looking for for so long. So, it turns out, this is how you have to live to not feel lonely. Christian, no matter how long he lived, was definitely not destined for a lonely old age. And Mr. Sebastian went to a lawyer to make all the arrangements in case of his death. Besides the money and everything that Christian was to inherit, Mr. Sebastian asked to pass on a letter to the young man, explaining his decision and thanking him for his humanity and kindness. Mr. Sebastian hurried for a reason. He didn't live long after that. Receiving the inheritance was a complete surprise and immense joy for Christian and his family. All problems were solved. And most importantly, according to his benefactor's request, Christian could continue to do good deeds on a large scale, not just by providing daily food packages to the homeless, but in a much more substantial way. Thanks to his efforts, many people who found themselves in difficult situations were able to start a new life.